The Morrison Formation is a world-renowned layer of rock that dates to the late Jurassic period. Many animals have been uncovered from these layers, including the largest and most adeptly qualified salad munchers and steak cutters to ever walk the face of the planet. One of these animals carried three crests atop its craggly skull, a line of armored scoots down its back, and a pair of small but handy arms. Meet your old friend, Ceratosaurus. How did we get here? Doctors Edward Drinker Cope and Othniel Charles Marsh were some of the most ambitious and treacherously stubborn paleontologists of the 1900s. Their exploits during the period known as the Bone Wars continues to reappear on my channel and will continue to do so far into the future as I revisit the history of paleontology. A TLDR for those uninitiated in the sordid history of the Bone Wars, these two nincompoops were once friends and colleagues helping to flesh out the then embryonic field of paleontology by swapping ideas, discussing how to analyze bones, and how it all worked together in the grand scheme of evolution. Over a period of several years, the two grew apart until a few last straws, including the infamous example of Dr. Cope placing the head of his elasmosaurus on the tail, completely broke their friendship. It did more than that though, and the two became bitter rivals that would go so far as to sabotage each other's dig sites to get one over on the other. The two raced to find, prepare, describe, and name as many fossil organisms as possible, which resulted in a bunch of now defunct names, but also pretty much every world famous dinosaur you could think of. Allosaurus, Brontosaurus, Apatosaurus, Diplodocus, Brachiosaurus, and more. The actions of these two, and all those they hired, succeeded in broadening our understanding of past life to greater lengths than had ever been done in the previous previous 300 years. Between the two scientists and their underlings, over 100 species of dinosaurs and over 1,000 species of fossil organisms altogether were uncovered and named. One of their many incredible finds were the remains of the crested Ceratosaurus. During the years of 1883 and 1884, farmer Marshall Felch found the remains of a theropod dinosaur in Garden Park, Colorado, just a few miles north of my old stomping grounds of Canyon City. This area is one of the richest fossil deposits of the Morrison Formation, which stretches over many states, including Utah, Wyoming, and Colorado. This find was an extraordinary one, especially for the time, for it was a nearly complete articulated skeleton encased in hard sandstone. Only a few parts of the skeleton were missing, but the majority was smooshed pretty badly due to the processes of fossilization. Like most of the finds from this area and time, it was acquired by Othniel Charles Marsh, who described the fossil and gave it the name Ceratosaurus nasicornis which means nasal horned, horned reptile, due to the bony protrusions above the bony nasal openings. Marsh worked at the Peabody Museum of Natural History. All the ceratosaurus material was sent there for him to describe. O.C. Marsh was missing a hefty section of the rib cage, but reconstructed the animal in such a way that it isn't too far off from what is now known of the skeleton. The biggest mistakes in his artfully inked skeletal reconstruction are of course the upright posture and dragging tail, but he also added too many back vertebrae, resulting in an overly elongated trunk. About 15 years later, in 1898 and 1899, these fossils were transferred over to the National Museum of Natural History in Washington DC, along with many other fossils originally in Marsh's collection. The Bone Wars forced those involved to prepare things as fast as possible, so that they could be ready for description and publication just as quickly. This meant that those holotypical ceratosaurus fossils never got fully prepared by Marsh and his staff at the Peabody. Once the remains took their trip to the Smithsonian, they would get some proper TLC to get ready for their exhibit display. This process lasted from 1911 to 1918. Unfortunately, the trip had also done some damage to the specimen. 
The fossils would not get their due till 1920 with the help of another famed paleontologist of the Smithsonian, Charles Gilmore. Gilmore and his team had to figure out a way to mount the specimen so that it could be displayed. They went with mounting it in bas relief, which is a sort of fake wall technique that allowed the skeleton to stand articulated as it would have looked in life, but does not allow for it to be freestanding, which is the way many skeletal mounts are constructed in recent years. Far ahead of its time, Gilmore had reconstructed the holotype in a bird-like horizontal position, which was done due to the angling of the thigh bones and remains more or less accurate to how we see this animal and all theropods today, though it, it does seem like it wants to fall back on its tail. The fossils of the holotype, encased in the plaque wall, had remained restricted from study until 2014 when the museum began its renovation of the fossil halls, which reopened in 2019 with the Ceratosaurus mount a freestanding cast replica, getting a good thwacking from a stegosaurus. The holotype remained the only specimen of this genus until the early 1960s, which seems to be the case for a lot of these early finds, no doubt due to Bone Wars shenanigans. The Cleveland Lloyd Dinosaur Quarry of Cleveland, Utah is another site of extreme diversity in late Jurassic Morrison formation flora and fauna. Alongside the likes of the mighty Allosaurus and the thunderous Apatosaurus, paleontologist James Madsen and his team excavated a new fragmentary specimen of Ceratosaurus. This new specimen included a skull and represented the largest Ceratosaurus yet found. This giant was disarticulated and fragmentary. Found over various dig seasons, the parts and pieces were collected from different areas of the same place and are thought to come from one individual animal. Enough of the specimen was found to suggest to Madsen and his team that they had a unique new kind of Ceratosaurus on their hands. Then, in 1976, a new specimen was uncovered from Fruta, Colorado by Thor Erickson. Fruta is another locality where a great wealth of fossil resources is found. These remains, which were articulated as a single skeleton, were taken to the nearby Dinosaur Journey Museum of Natural History. When I say articulation, I mean many of the pieces of the skeleton were in the same place they were when the animal died. A whole piece, so to speak. The entire underside of the animal was missing, which included the lower jaw, the arms, and the belly ribs. James Madsen and his co-author Samuel Wells published a long monograph describing the Utah specimens of Ceratosaurus, which included their 1960s finds and Erickson's 1976 find. The big 1960s specimen was named Ceratosaurus dentisulcatus, meaning furrow-toothed horned lizard, after the furrows found in its teeth, larger, more curved teeth, and nose holes placed further down in front of the snout. They then named Erickson's specimen Ceratosaurus magnicornis, meaning large horned lizard, due to the size of the crests atop its head. Following this discovery was one made in 1992 by means of the Agate Basin Quarry of Utah. This find has remained undescribed and unnamed, but fossil material found, which include the front half of the skull, vertebrae, and pelvic bones, suggest an animal even bigger than Ceratosaurus dentisulcatus. In 1999, paleontologist Brooks Britt described yet another specimen of Ceratosaurus from Bone Cabin Quarry in Wyoming, and it was the first to represent a rather young individual. Researchers reasoned it as a juvenile animal due to the unfused sutures in the bones. This is one of the most common characteristics of immaturity, since young animals have a lot more cartilage in their skeletons than adult animals do. A few more finds of Ceratosaurus have been found in other dig sites throughout the American Southwest, but none were complete. Most are extremely fragmentary teeth and vertebrae. These bits and pieces have been recovered from Dinosaur National Monument in Utah, Como Bluff in Wyoming, and Dry Mesa and Migat Moor quarries in Colorado. Other animals found in the same deposits as Ceratosaurus usually have tens of specimens to their genus, but not so for Ceratosaurus. Not many of the horned reptile are found with much frequency. This might point towards the animal's rarity in its ecosystem, but before jumping to that conclusion, I think we should check in on the Jurassic deposits overseas, Europe and Africa specifically. 
Over the course of Earth's history, the continents have moved around into various positions. Everyone knows that all the continents were connected as one supercontinent called Pangaea. As the Triassic period transitioned into the Jurassic period, the continents broke up and moved once again. During the time of Ceratosaurus though, the continent of Europe was a series of large and small islands. These islands didn't contact the fledgling continent of North America, but they were extremely close as a consequence of being connected only tens of millions of years prior. Africa, however, had fully disconnected from North America and Europe, but remained attached to South America, India, Antarctica, and Australia. In the Triassic, the connection meant populations of organisms weren't as isolated as they are today, but in the Jurassic, they started to diversify. I bring up tectonics here because the flora and fauna of Jurassic North America, Europe, and Africa had a lot of similarities. These continents contained long-necked, long-tailed diplodocids, big-armed, giraffe-like macronarians, early iguanodonts, allosaurs, megalosaurs, stegosaurs, early ankylosaurs, and more. In the early 1900s, the remains of something resembling ceratosaurus were taken from the sediments of what is now known as Tanzania. From 1909 to 1913, the extremely industrious German paleontologist Werner Janinch and his team set off to the extraordinarily productive outcrops of the Tendaguru Formation in Tanzania. In the three years prior to this expedition, over 250 tons of bones from a slew of different dinosaurs had been recovered, but this newer trip to the rocks brought back some fragmentary carnivore remains. Janinch finally got to describing these theropod dinosaur remains in 1925, once he'd gotten them back to the Berlin Museum for Naturkund. The remains he described as Ceratosaurus were parts of the skull, leg, and vertebrae from the tail. Eventually, he figured there was enough difference between his fragments and those skeletons found in North America, so he called it Ceratosaurus Roeschlingi. Madsen and Wells were good man and thorough. And among their thorough work in their monograph, they made sure to include these African pieces of these horny- I mean horned reptile. They found that the remains described by Janinch were not diagnostic enough to be the scaffolding to support the work crew of the Ceratosaurus Roeschlingi species. The bones were therefore just labeled Ceratosaurus without any more specifics. Some researchers have questioned Madsen and Wells' analyses here, instead suggesting that the Tendaguru Ceratosaurus remains aren't diagnostic enough to call them Ceratosaurus at all. Diagnostic is the term used to describe how unique an organism is from already known ones. The more diagnostic, the more unique and separate from its most recent common ancestors and cousins. For example, paleontologist Oliver Rauhat wrote in 2011 that both the weird African ceratosaurus fossils and some other twofers found in the same area could possibly be some kind of ceratosaur, but can't be confidently given the title of ceratosaurus. That would make whatever animal those pieces belong to a relative of ceratosaurus itself. In Portugal, a team of paleontologists led by Octavio Matias were dusting and chiseling away fragments of fine-grained yellow sandstone that were once part of a Jurassic floodplain. The team uncovered a right femur, left tibia, and many teeth that probably belonged to Ceratosaurus. This find, made between 2000 and 2006, came from the Lorinha Formation a fossil-rich layer of rock that contains just about the same types of animals found in the American Southwest's Morrison Formation. This material was finally described in 2015 as belonging to the already erected species Ceratosaurus tetisulcatus by Matthias and friends. Some researchers have questioned this classification under the assertion that the bones aren't diagnostic enough for a species-level distinction. Instead, the researchers argue, the remains are only able to be called Ceratosaurus. Aside from those specimens that are definitely Ceratosaurus, or those that may or may not be Ceratosaurus, some Ceratosaurus-adjacent fossils in the form of teeth were uncovered in Switzerland by Werner Janich, and there's some teeth from Uruguay. The characteristics of the Uruguay teeth are technically only found in Ceratosaurus, but the researchers who described them cautioned away from slapping the Ceratosaurus label on them till more remains are found to corroborate such an identity. 
With all these specimens of the handsome horned himbo lizard, I think it's time to compile them all together and assess what they mean for the biology of the animal. Make sure you leave a like and comment on this video, share it around and subscribe. While you're at it, ring the notification bell too if you want to stay in the know with everything Edge. Thanks for watching. Want to help Edge out? Subscribe to the Patreon at any tier you like for a whole smorgasbord of delicious offerings. Many thanks to Thea Svensson, Steve Bradshaw, Staniforth Hopkins, Natty Cat, Dinosaur, Arda Bayer, Abby Smith, Henry Brennan, Dana Manchester, Chris Frampton, and Antron. You've all helped to make this channel possible. Thank you, thank you, thank you.